We're really excited here tonight um, to be partnering with the CUME Initiative. If you haven't grabbed one of their brochures, you're going to hear much about them throughout this event. Um, but uh, please grab one of their brochures outside. And of course, don't forget, um, following this event, you will be rewarded with a reception upstairs in our lobby. So that means you have to stay through the entire event. Um, I'm very excited about this event, both both what CUME Initiative does and the conversation around the ultra-Orthodox community in Israel specifically is something that I think is extremely important. And specifically, um, the show Shtisel, I'm proud to say we, before Netflix ever heard of Shtisel, um, we were screening here seasons and, um, and uh, begging audiences to come. And uh, um, of course, now it's really all, all people want to talk about. Um, so, so we're really excited to have this conversation, and you'll hear a lot more about it. But now I get to introduce the moderator of tonight's conversation, um, Daphne Merkin. Daphne, please, you can join us here. Daphne is a novelist and cultural critic who has been a staff writer for The New Yorker, a contributing writer for The New York Times Magazine, um, T Magazine, L, and Tablet. She has frequently, fr um, um, uh, she frequently for other publications, including The New York Review of Books, The New York Times Book Review, The Wall Street Journal, Book Forum, the Times Literary Supplement, Travel and Leisure and Departures. She has contributed to several Jewish theme anthologies, including the Jewish Girl's Guide to Guilt, which I remember doing an event around, uh, around that, and Testimony, Contemporary Writers Make the Holocaust Personal. Merkin is also is the author of five books, which include an essay collection called Dreaming of Hitler and a Memoir of Depression, um, this, this Close to Happy. Her latest novel, 22 Minutes of Unconditional Love, came out in paperback. Check those all out. I've uh, read some, and she's a fabulous writer. Um, this past July, um, her first novel, Enchantment, won the Edward Lewis um, Wallant Award for the best new work of fiction based on a Jewish theme. Merkin has been profiled in Haaretz and um, has written a, an essay for them about the demonization of Israel. Most recently, she reviewed Gerard Moret's film, The Human Factor, fabulous film, about 30, 30 years of American negotiations in the Middle East um, for the New Republic, and David Grossman's More Than I Love My Life for the New York Times Book Review. Daphne, over to you. Maybe now, yes. Okay. Um, I like, I suppose, most of you here. I'm an enormous fan of Stizzle, which I had heard about first from my sister who lives in Jerusalem, just as I heard about in treatment, Petit Paul. And I wrote an article about it for the Times at the time saying, sort of leave it to Israelis to manage to come up with a show about therapy that people want to watch. Um, <laughs> this evening, um, we, we will be discussing the whole subject of, as one of the founders of this organi organization put it, in a way it's church and state. What is going on in Israel now between the, so the Haredi, or ultra-Orthodox community and the secular community in Israel. And we are going to sort of use Shtizel as the entry point to how, how the Haredi community is represented in, in the media. Um, maybe also as opposed to how people see them in regular life. And we'll also be, be discussing some other programs like um, Unorthodox, is it called My Orthodox Life or My Unorthodox, <laughs> My Orth, right. I want to now introduce, one second. I want to introduce Yohonatan Indursky, 
who is an award-winning writer and director, a graduate of the elite ultra-Orthodox Punavish, it says Punavish Yeshiva, which is about as, is the Harvard of yeshivas, and later an alumnus of the Jerusalem Sam Spiegel Film School. I'm just stopping to say in a piece I wrote about Israeli movies, which are better than most, Israel is such a movie mad country. First of all, there's a, who's that director I can't abide? There's a cafe made for, with the big jaw. Do you know who I mean? He's sort of considered transgressive. Doesn't matter, I give up. Who? No, he married an Israeli, he's American. Tarantino. Tarantino. There's a bar in Tel Aviv named Tarantino's, and it is a tiny country to have 15 film schools. But anyway, Yehonatan and Dorsky wrote and created with Ori alone the esteemed drama series Shizzle, which won 17 Israeli Academy of Television Awards. The series is currently an international hit on Netflix. His full-length documentary, Punavish Time, was nominated for Best Documentary Film at the Israeli Academy Awards. Driver, in 2018, his first full-length film, won the Israeli Critics Award. Indursky wrote and directed the series Autonomies, which won the Refledor Ref for Best International Television Series at the Geneva International Film Festival. So could we now in welcome wherever Yehonatan is? Hi. <laughs> and hear, hear about the mind and thinking behind Shizzle. Oh, thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I would love to get this paper. I will send you to my mother. It's a, <laughs> she, will, she will be very happy. <laughs> and, and maybe one day you will forget also my name. I, I like Tarantino. It will be great. <laughs> Um, I think we're going to start with your showing a clip from Shizzle. I think that's what we said. Yeah. Um, and then we'll talk after. Is that okay? Sounds good. Good.
Thank you. I'm ready to watch it all over again, as I'm <laughs> sure a lot of you are. Um, I wanted to ask Yohonatan to tell us about his own background and how you came to be a co-creator of a worldwide hit TV yeah, show. Yeah. An unlikely worldwide hit. <laughs> but maybe before, um, I, will I will start with this clip. And I will tell you a story, because I like stories, and I'm sure you also. And the story is about um, the great American author, uh, Thomas Wolfe. And he wrote uh, some book about his childhood, about the place he, he grew up there. And one day he encounters a woman on a train. And she tells him, uh, wow, you, you wrote a great book. Congratulations. And he says, um, yes, thank you. But you know, I can't go there because Everyone is angry with me, thinking I sold my, my childhood, my parents, my, my memories, all for my glory. And she says, so this mean you can't go home again. And he says, um, wow, can I use this sentence? <laughs> <laughs> and like you know, this becomes the title of his next book. And I must to tell you that I think this story is connected to any creator that uh, try to tell his uh, uh, childhood or the place where she or he came from. And you can see it also in this scene. Actually, I watched it through you because I watched you watching the scene, which is interesting. And because Stiesel is story, Stiesel this is a story about a young uh, uh, artist that he tries to, to, to describe or to, to paint his, his family, his culture, his, his the place in this specific scene, his mother. And somehow, when you try to tell your story, your, your, your background, you, you're forced to, to go outside and look at it from, from outside. So you, you can't go home again, and in a way. And um, about my childhood, I grew up in, in a Haredi um, family, ultra-Orthodox family in Jerusalem, in Givat Shaul neighborhood. It's in the entrance of Jerusalem. And all my childhood, I was uh, like uh, very close to this area, just you know, Jerusalem is a big city, and most of it is secular. And it's kind of a two cities. And you, you can be like till maybe, I don't know which age, but I, you can stay in your place and, and not see the, the, all the, the most of uh, areas of Jerusalem. You know, even if I had uh, reached a doctor or something, it was very uh, like business go do what is necessary without looking around too much and go straight back home. So um, I had a beautiful childhood. Um, some moments were maybe less fun, but even even this even these moments I remember with with lots of uh, nostalgia. You know that this this word nostalgia is uh, uh, combined from two two Greek words, um, I think, uh, 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 nostos and algos, which is, it's like a om, om sickness in English. It's mean the, the pain that you feel when, when you are trying to go back home. So, um, yes, and you know, um, um, when I was uh, 14, or maybe 13 even, I, I understood that if I want to be meaningful, I had to, 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 do, to do a big change. And Let me I interrupt, Yonatan, I'm curious. When you use the word meaningful, do you mean meaningful to yourself? When you use the word meaningful, did you mean you meaningful to yourself 
because in the community you were meaningful to, by to being part of the community to everything to everything you know uh, but but it's the same you know because if you if you are meaning to the to the to the community you are meaning to yourself it's something that you can find i think just in in, in um, uh, orthodox uh, communities that you are you are part of of community and you have maybe uh, you have nothing except that not nothing but you have all what you have it's that you part of the community mm -hmm. so I, I i had a purpose very clear purpose and i i uh, the purpose was to to accept to the most respected yeshiva like you said the uh, harvard of yeshivas it's called ponovich yeshiva in bnei Brak, which is very hard to get in and you need to go through many exams and stuff and yes, I did it, and um, uh, my, my, my parents were very proud, but they were also worried about how their little boy will, will survive the, this big place called Ponovich. And actually this worry became a reality because I, I survived there maybe almost three years, which is a lot of time uh, for me. Uh, it was uh, maybe my toughest uh, years, but I'd never uh, give up any moment, not in Ponovich and not in my childhood, of course. And one day I, I decided to, to, to search for a, for a new passion, a new home. It was, I was uh, 18, and I, uh, I took the bus to, to Jerusalem. Um, yeah. Were I your parents dis? Is it on? Yes. Yeah. Were your parents disappointed that you left Ponovich? Of course, yeah. of course, of course. I think one of the the, the main uh, tough things that I had to think about it's how how I can come to them and say, listen, I I I am leaving all all what you gave me, and I remember when I was. Um, like in the night before I left the yeshiva. So just my parents didn't know about. And just one of my friends from the yeshiva knew that I'm going to leave. And he asked me that in the last evening before I leave to go with him to pray in the wailing bowl, Ba'kotel Amaravi in Jerusalem. So um, when we were on the bus there, he started talking to me and I, I thought maybe he trying to, to convince me to stay in the yeshiva, but <laughs> from my surprise, he started, he started uh, uh, telling me a joke, and it was actually a dirty joke. <laughs> and he said, I'm going with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm I, I afraid that this is what, but I, 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 I think he, he, he tried to, to, to show me that he also knows something about the world outside the yeshiva, but I remember how this joke just shaking me, <laughs> I just couldn't carry it because, okay, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I have a, 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 a role and I, I need to, to leave the yeshiva. I, I feel that I, I need to go far away. But you know, uh, my friend, my old friend, I don't know where is he now, um, Laser, this is his name. You, you have a different role and you need to stay in the yeshiva. You need to, to preserve what maybe I no longer can. And uh, yeah, the, 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 the day before, the day after I left the yeshiva with a small luggage that had one wheel that was missing. <laughs> so it kept dragging towards one side, like uh, something inside me said, maybe, maybe, you, should maybe you should to, to, to stay here. <laughs> Um, yeah, and maybe. <laughs> Did you know when you left what you were going to do next? Of course not. Of course not. Of course not. Um, because you, 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 when you are living the yeshiva, when you are living the, the, uh, the, the ultra-Orthodox life, and this is something that we are speaking, we'll speak about this evening. It's a very, very important issue. You are go with nothing. You have, uh, uh, I don't know if you know, but in, in ultra-Orthodox schools, the, the main bulk if, if of, of what is learned is just a Jewish, uh, Jewish law, Jewish uh, like Talmud and um, etc. And uh, there is a, um, a, um, something for, uh, you know, uh, maybe a, a, a 
a bit of, of secular right. uh, that, that I didn't learn English because that my English is just perfect, like <laughs> <laughs> you can hear. <laughs> And not, uh, not math, not nothing. So you go outside the yeshiva, you are 18 or in, in my luck, uh, uh, but you can also be like 30 and maybe with, with some uh, uh, children, four or five, or I don't know. And you go outside the, 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 the Haredi world with, with nothing. You have, you have no, no English, no math, no. You can't even go to the university to learn because you have uh, you have no the, the the skills for 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 it so um yeah i think maybe the 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 reason that it's not the reason but one of the reasons the the technic reason that i chose uh, cinema studies it was because in the cinema school you don't need to to be like um educated uh, you can go with nothing and okay let's see if you <laughs> if you are good uh, so uh, yes the, you know for 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 a young uh, young boy young man I don't know uh, to start a new uh, a new life with uh, with nothing it's very very non not easy isn't there also in Jerusalem an Orthodox film school there is an um, uh, there is a, a Orthodox film school, not ultra orthodox, no, of course. No, yeah. uh, it's called Male. Right. My partner, uh, my co-writer uh, Ori Elon, uh, studied in this uh, right. uh, this uh, very good uh, uh, film school. But you know, I, I when I when I ask myself if I want to go to to Male or to Sam Spiegel films, I, I remember. Because I uh, maybe it's good, it's uh, right. uh, orthodox. Why, why not? So I opened the the, the syllabus of the semester, and I saw uh, you have a uh, you have a course about uh, Rabbi Nachman and cinema. And you know Rabbi Nachman, I know him uh, very well. I don't know if I go to cinema school to <laughs> to learn about Rabbi Nachman. I right. can I can teach you about him. So so I I, I decide to go to Sam Spiegel. I think. Uh, 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 I wrong. <laughs> I'm joking. No, uh, uh, both both schools they are they are they are they are very good. But when you say I think it's true, it's in this microphone. Um, when you say you didn't need really the tools that you didn't have, you didn't need them because everything was in Hebrew. I'm curious why in film school could you get along. You know, uh, uh, when you go to, to the university, um, uh, so you have to go, uh, you have to be like uh, 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 well uh, educated, Tated. like, uh, uh, I don't know how to uh, call it, the bagrut? The yeah. yeah. Something, yeah, you, you understood me. Uh, uh -huh. So uh, even without this, <laughs> um, uh, so um, uh, yeah, 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 so you can't go to university if you want to go to the university, you need to, like, maybe to take two years of studying something that all boys studying at, at, at uh, you know, at uh, eight years old. So you need to start from nothing. It's, nothing. it's very, it's really hard. And you have also to, to care about yourself, about, you need a job, you need to pay about your studies, you need to pay about, um, uh, uh, your apartment, I don't know, and if you are if you are Haredi, and you have uh, five children, and you decide to go outside the, the koilel, which is a kind of yeshiva for married people, um, so you need to 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 you know they used to see they used to say you know a lot of years uh, the the cinema or the series that made about ultra orthodox in Israel was about just about people that want to leave the 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 community and i think Stiesel is one of the the, the first that uh, uh but there was also ju just just I, I will finish I, 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 they they used to say to to break the walls that someone want to go outside the but you know even if someone decide to 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 stay in the in the community and to be Haredi which is uh, amazing um you need to break the walls and to start from nothing, which is very, very hard. Right. I, 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 yeah, I know it. I no, know. I was it. just going to ask you about another TV show that I liked a lot. It was about um, 
Shababniki, maybe? No, this about one? the modern Orthodox Jay Srugim. Oh, Srugim. Yeah, Srugim was actually a beautiful uh, series, not about Orthodox, but no. about, uh, not about ultra Orthodox, sorry, but the modern and Orthodox yeah. in Israel and uh, in Jerusalem. And I, I will tell you a, a, a nice story about uh, about uh, about through game in a way, but because when we just started uh, working before, actually before star star, we started working on Stiesel. So we went to the to the broadcaster, to the content manager, to to make him like a, I don't know a pitch, a presentation, and it was just a, a while after through game was heard, and it was also on yes and the same uh, uh, pro producer also. <laughs> so he told us, listen, if, if there is even one religious character in this new series you're trying to sell me, please come back to me in, I don't know, a few, uh, few, uh, few years, two centuries, <laughs> exactly. And I don't know how we had uh, the chutzpah to tell him uh, right, right away, listen, there is no even one religious character <laughs> in, this, in this, which is, which is maybe not a, uh, maybe, maybe not a, 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 a pure truth, but, <laughs> but I truly believe that uh, Stiesel is not a series about ultra-Orthodox people, but a series that deal with, deals with, 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 with human beings. Yes. With human beings and the, the conflicts of the of the characters, they are not connecting to uh, especially to the to the to to the fact that they are ultra orthodox. Right. They have they have troubles. They have tzures like all we have, and because that we can we can identify right. with uh, with them. I think that's what made it so relatable to to all my secular. Jewish friends who I think had many, many preconceived notions about what the ultra-Orthodox community is about, mostly negative, I would add. Um, so they sort of sat wide-eyed. Um, Yohanatan, could you say a little more, how did you transition? You know, you're coming out of Ponevesh with a with a suitcase with one wheel, or three wheels, whatever, and um, you didn't suddenly go from that, as you said, to being a write a creator. So could you say a little bit how yeah. you? Yeah. So when I left the yeshiva, so I start I I started uh, you know searching myself and trying to okay what 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 I what I will do in this very strange world that nobody care about you and you can't go to to the to the dining room in the yeshiva and and you have uh, everything that you need so uh, in the in the in the first year i worked at a journalist in the ultra orthodox oh. uh, paper news it was funny because uh, i wrote maybe in a, uh, i don't know 20 or maybe more uh, synonyms I, I, I wrote like the whole uh, uh, newspaper from the beginning till the, the end. Like it was uh, uh, news uh, about rabbis that uh, passed away. I, I, I wrote also a story, uh, uh, like a fiction story. And even the, the letters for the, for the editor, I wrote, <laughs> I wrote it also. It was a half, a half page that you need to, to, to fool. And the editor say, listen, nobody sent uh, a letter. So you, so I, I wrote letters from, you know, week by week to to myself. I wrote something, and then a week later, I walk. I, I wrote to, to this guy. It was uh, crazy. All all my personality go go go, go through these uh, letters. Yeah. So uh, after after a year or maybe a year and a half uh, in uh, um, in this job, I I started uh, realize that I need to to do something with my life. So I thought maybe to go to to finish my uh, my uh, uh, my studies to go to to the university or something, but I think something inside me was very very um, something was clear to me that uh, I I I I have to tell stories. I don't know maybe from from my childhood I really liked stories and uh, and. I remember uh, uh, when I when I worked in this paper news, so um, 
in the evenings I, I went to, to, to see uh, movies in the, in the cinema and with a friend of mine. And one day he told me, listen, uh, uh, you can, I, I found something amazing. You can buy for, I don't know, for uh, 10 uh, movies and you can see all the year movies which it was the cinema tech in Jerusalem, which is not the movies that I, 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 I accept to, to see. Like I, I came there and the first movie I saw, it was Bergman movie in black and white, no subtitles. And I, I can't till now see a uh, uh, um, uh, Swedish uh, uh, movie with, yeah. with, with, uh, with English subtitles. So I, I, I sit there and I saw it's called for my luck, it's called the, the 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 film called the Silence, which is mean no no many uh, um, uh, sentence. So, um, but but I think I felt I, I I started go to this cinema and I start I, I I felt how each movie that I'm seeing is is changing me in a way, mm -hmm. and 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 maybe w one day I I, I saw a, a, a film of uh, David Perlov. I don't know if you know. Love. He's uh, actually a, a, a director. He, he direct uh, mainly a documentary about himself. He took like uh, a, a small f uh, 16 millimeters camera and and shot and and, and uh, shot his, his his life. And when I saw it, I, I because before I uh, when I thought about cinema, it was. Okay, Hollywood, the big uh, effects and uh, big uh, budget, and uh, wha what the connect of this amazing world to my uh, uh, to 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 this uh, uh, small uh, Jewish uh, boy in Jerusalem? But when I saw this uh, this amazing, uh, you should to to see the, to see it. It's called Diary. It's six, I think, six chapter of uh, of six movies. And I saw it, and I, and I understood that maybe cinema it can be also, you know, just true, tr just uh, uh, two uh, trees in the wind, right. and 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 you can you can do cinema uh, from your heart, not from a uh, big budget. Big budget. Did you? I'm just curious. Did you get any help? Like um, you were, after all, penniless. So did you get some help? Some kind organization or or actually i because i left the ultra orthodox um community so it is some uh, organization that helps uh that helps people from the ultra orthodox community to to go outside the yeshiva but i i i was there about very very short time but i understood that they they I don't know. I, I I didn't like this uh, uh, special special organization. The, the, uh, especially this organization. Not be, they they were very good people and they want to. But I felt that, like I I, I told them in the beginning. You know, I am in a very good uh, connection with my parents and I, I used to live uh, in my parents' home, in during when I when I work in this uh, paper news. Paper. Yeah. So to they told me, listen, we are we are el helping just for someone he who leave the community. The okay, what what I need, I need to kick them. <laughs> you know wh what I need to do for my parents to 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 that you 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 can help, help me. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, they gave me in the beginning some uh, very, but but you know uh, it was all 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 me, like to to work to to. To make an, an cinema school is very very tough studies. You right. need to go to to the productions. You have no uh, uh, weekends. You have nothing, and and you have to pay about of course about the, the studies. So it was tough, but yeah. but tough is good, you know. Um, now it's quite amazing you made the transition. Um, Yohonatan, I think maybe um, this is a good moment to introduce the second clip. Of from, let's do it. Yes. And this is from uh, the the third season of Stissel, the, the the last the last one.
Um, I'm going to introduce the other panel members. Um, on my right is Avital Chisink Goldschmidt, um, is a writer living in New York City. Her work has appeared in The Atlantic, The New York Times, Foreign Policy, Vox, Vogue, Salon, Glamour, Business Insider, Los Angeles Review of Books, Jewish Review of Books, and Religion and Politics, among others. And Avital has taught journalism at Yeshiva University's Stern College for Women. Previously, she was the life editor at The Forward and a reporter for Haaretz. She is a recipient of honors from the Atlantic, Moment, the National Foundation for Advancement in the Arts, and elsewhere. Avital does pastoral work alongside her husband, Rabbi Benjamin Goldschmidt, in, on Manhattan's Upper East Side. Um, to my left, the first one to my left is Tom in Intrader. Oh, are these all together? Oh, I'm introducing both. Tom Intrader and Sean Goldberg are the co founders of the Kiyum Initiative, an organization that provides Haredi males with the tools they need in order to achieve economic independence while maintaining their religious lifestyle. Tom Intrader is a founder and managing partner of real estate investment, the real estate investment firm 18 Main. Sean Goldberg is a director at LW Investments, a family investment office based in Herzliya, Israel. Um, um, Avital, to begin with. Hi. Hi. Nice to see you all. Um, first of all, I'm just curious from your point of view, how do you see the portrayal of women in these new TV shows um, and also some of the movies that we haven't really talked about. <laughs> sure, I, I think it's, it's become already a genre of its own, so yeah. it's hard to sort of say, well, this is how women are portrayed. Um, you know, there's Shisel, you have, let's say we include Srugim in this mix, Shabab Nikim, um, my unorthodox life is certainly very different. Um, <laughs> as an orthodox woman, we can talk about. I can talk about that for a while too. Um, so I think it really depends on the show, on the country, on the community that is being portrayed, yeah. and the guiding principles of the creators. Um, and I also want to include and mention Rama Borstein's uh, "To Fill the Void," which I think is notable and, and beautiful. Um, so I think you know, there's there's a lot of this clip in particular shows a very specific uh, reality in Israel today and in the Haredi community and beyond, um, one that I see both as an Orthodox Jewish woman just existing and talking to my friends, but also um, obviously as a journalist, this is something I report on a lot, um, due to the Kolel lifestyle, especially in Israel, women have really had to step in as breadwinners um, over the last few decades, uh, which has become a very interesting phenomenon, which is really, I think, encapsulated in this clip, where you have women who have become very empowered. Um, actually, I think it was just this past year that the employment rate of Haredi women actually surpassed the employment rate of secular women in Israel, just so you understand how strong women's employment is there. Um, so, and, and what that has done is women have also you know, traditionally they would be uh, teachers or maybe a nurse or maybe a therapist, but many of them are starting to go into high tech um, where obviously the salaries are, are higher, right? Um, and of course it's still limited because as, <laughs> as we saw just now, these women are still in charge of their homes and they still have many commitments and obligations outside of work that they're trying to sort of manage. So they're not really able to necessarily always make them the sort of income that if a large family might need. But you know what it's done interestingly is that there's a big uh, discussion about gender role reversal in the Haredi community. Um, there was recently, there was a case of a rabbi who was complaining that Nebach, the men, are starting to cook in the community. <laughs> Ours. <laughs> because the women are working so hard. Um, there's an amazing article in the Haredi magazine, Tzarich uh, online, 
called the Haredi Woman's, uh, the Haredi Superwoman Complex, which describes this ideal, almost sort of like Anne Marie Slaughter's article in the Atlantic a few years ago about can women have it all? Um, can a Haredi woman have it all? Can you work a high power job in Intel and run home to your many children and make a home, you know, fresh meal? and make Shabbos and make sure your home is beautiful, et cetera, et cetera, all the pressures on these women. Um, and, this, and, and I think that's a, that's, a, that's a struggle that is one of the most defining struggles, I think, of being a religious woman today in this community. Um, in, but one, one thing I do want to mention is that one thing I've noticed in my reporting on Orthodox women's lives, which is really my beat, um, we are seeing a growing, I would say, empowerment due to this breadwinner situation, which, by the way, was not what the system wanted, right? They just wanted women to pay for, you know, life. But they didn't expect, I think, for women to become so empowered. So first of all, you have, obviously, financial empowerment. You can go and buy that car, right? No matter what he says, she's going to go and buy that car. Um, and that has really translated into other forms of empowerment, which are we're starting, starting, starting to see. So you will see some sort of religious and spiritual empowerment. Um, I actually went <laughs> shortly before COVID. I was in Jerusalem, and I reported on a growing phenomenon of these underground bate midrash, um, these spaces where Haredi women go to learn Talmud, which is traditionally a male subject. Right? And these women decided, well, <laughs> if I'm a CEO, I'm working at Intel, I'm a lawyer, I'm an architect, I'm a doctor, why can't I also learn Talmud? Right? Um, you're also seeing a political empowerment that is happening where more and more women are becoming politically active. Uh, for foreign policy, I recently profiled Rivka Ravitz, who was the chief of staff of President Ruvi Rivlin. You may have read about her. She's a mother of 12. She went to visit uh, President Biden this past summer, and he knelt in front of her. As a Catholic, he really respected her as a mother. Um, I happened to see her this past Shabbat. You're seeing someone who's really coming from the Haredi system, um, who has not only grown in politics, but she has actually publicly recently stated that she actually wants to run for office and become a Knesset member of a Haredi party. The one problem is Haredi parties don't allow women into their parties. So she's a little bit in a, in a, <laughs> a fix over there. But uh, she sorry, really. Sorry, I was going to ask you one yes. question. Uh, looking on at that world, which I guess the whole issue of women mm -hmm. learning Jewishly texts. Yeah. Many years ago, when I was in book publishing, I published a book on that subject by someone named Vanessa Oakes, mm -hmm. and it was called Words on Fire, yeah. because the quote from Rabbi someone right. that uh, for a woman to study. Yeah. yeah um, but I wanted to ask one thing. Do most of the people here know what the Kolel system is about? Or let's, maybe we should explain it. Well, I, I'm a woman, so I may not <laughs> tell you the best story. But Essentially, this is, as you, I think you mentioned, gave the right definition, it's yeshiva for married men. Um, so you have married men, husbands, who are, who are studying full day in, yeshiva, in a yeshiva system um, who receive a stipend for it. Right, and there was no, I mean, once upon a time, I think um, kolel was meant more for iluyim, for men who were brilliant, uh, certainly in, um, in um, Germany, where my family is from, and they were, they, uh, there was a broyer community, and my mother's a broyer, and the whole idea that the kolel takes anyone I mean, you can be a dope <laughs> and sit there all day. Um, yeah, I, I, I will tell you. Uh, no, my, uh, I will tell a story about my nephew. He, is <laughs> he oh, accidentally is not, not a dope. He is a very, very brilliant person, and uh, I really like him. And he's very smart and uh, and cute because he is my nephew. <laughs> and um, he's uh, he's twenty twenty. 26 maybe he has two two boys mm -hmm. um, uh, actually boy and, and girl and uh, sorry two children I mean uh, boy and girl and um, he after he after he married uh, five uh, four years ago he went to Koilel, which is something that all the the, the married uh, uh, Haredi men they are going to Koilel to run to learn all the day 
and you know he he liked uh, to learn he he were in the yeshiva he, were, he was uh, pretty good and uh, but um, I think he, he felt that something uh, is, is is missing to him and his wife she is um, a very successful uh, architect Ar architect <laughs> sorry tell it uh, I mispronounced Ar architect architect I, I will tell you like I will tell it well like enough. like in Hebrew yeah architect is good like in Hebrew you say adrichal which right. is mean uh, better right so um uh, and and she she she's doing very very well and he started uh helping her in the you know in 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 the office to to call people to 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 set meetings mm -hmm. and all because he's good with with people and he's like the the brain and one day like just a, a, ma a month or two months ago he speak with with my mother with his grandmother and it was uh, like uh, uh, by noon in the uh, on the day, and and my mother asked him, uh, "Wow, uh, where are you? You are not in the koilel." So he says, uh, "Grandma, I don't know how to tell you that, but I, I left the koilel like uh, uh, maybe from the uh, half half <laughs> half year ago." And she was, "Wow, it's a it's a big uh, it's a big thing. Why?" And the story is that they they he he went to the office uh, every day and it start with uh, I don't know half uh, half hour and then they think maybe to put uh, to 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 put in some uh, uh, worker or some uh, secretary to help and then he said I can uh -huh. I can be the <laughs> the secretary and um, uh, bef b b b uh, why I need to sit in the coil and learn, uh, which is very, very important, but it's not making, it's not make me happy. It's not bring me. Of course, there is a lot of people that they are happy to, right. to be in the coil and to run, but he felt that, and I think it's, it's amazing. And maybe um, uh, if he, he, he understood it uh, uh, three or four years ago, it was better, you yeah. know? For him, for his family, for his wife, for for. But it requires that he did not have the personality, of like the this guy. <laughs> you know <laughs> what? You know it's you know it's very funny because uh, they used to say that uh, the Haredi uh, society they are very uh, chauvinistic and non non feministic, which is which is true by the way. But you know it's it's I, I think for me and and this scene can show shows us very well. Uh, this is uh, uh, this is a game, and uh, in the game, it's it looks like the the man has the power, and but but the truth is I that yeah, but the truth is that uh, uh, and and this is something very strong that we 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 try to put on Stiesel that the women the Stiesel women and the women in my life uh, um, they are very strong. strong. They are they are they are they are know everything. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to mess with these women. <laughs> Avital, I had you one other question. You don't know how much you're right. <laughs> Before we move on, do you see in some succinct way differences between Israeli and American Haredi women? Or is, yeah. Yeah, very much so. I think um, a actually because of this, role of breadwinner, um, Israeli Haredi women are actually much more empowered in a way that American Haredi women are not, I think. Um, I think we are, you know, I think Israeli, we, we, we as two communities, I think we're very fluid in a way, but Israelis look to us like we're so advanced and so progressive, but we look to them in some ways that they're much more progressive. Um, an example of that would be just um, to mention the thing that's really ripping the Haredi world apart this past week was the story of Chaim Valder, the celebrity children's author who was uh, accused of sexual abuse and rape. Um, this was like a ground, sh you know, shattering uh, piece of news in the Haredi community that I think really shook a lot of people. Uh, this was a story that happened only because several Haredi women decided to make it in Israel, decided to make, to basically start a Me Too movement which is, to an American Orthodox woman, shocking and also very inspiring, yeah. right? I really wish we would be in that position. Yeah. Um, and I think a lot of it is because of this um, unexpected turn of events with the breadwinner right. status. Um, 
I'm just going to introduce, I'm not, I've introduced them already. Um, my question is to Sean. You founded the Kiyom Initiative with the aim of addressing the role of Haredim in Israel. Um, just on a purely, uh, not personal, but interest, interested note, why is this conversation and this program so important to you? Well, uh, thank you for, first of all, for hosting us. I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with uh, a little anecdote about myself. Um, I was born on the Upper West Side to Israeli parents. Um, I attended a school, some of you may know, called Rodef Shalom, up the street. Um, and every weekend, I played basketball in this JCC with all my friends. Um, so uh, it's great, great to be back. Um, as a person who has that dual um, Israeli-American perspective, um, it's something that stood out. Uh, you know, you see it from an outside, outside view. Um, what's going on in Israel right now is, uh, you know, it's a very, very serious tectonic shift in the society of Israel and the culture of Israel. Um, and it's, you know, it's all over. It, you, you feel it all the time. You watch TV, you watch the news, you step outside, you're, 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 it's, it's, uh, I use the word uh, Kulturkampf almost. It's a culture war, um, and you really feel it. But what what kind of what got to me is is the fact that the discussion, you know, the critical discussion about what is happening um, was not being had. It was not being had in a way that uh, at least that I saw it being uh, ha happening um, in forums like this. Uh, discussing the nuances of the uh, Haredi community, um, discussing the differences between the American Haredi community and the Israeli Haredi community. Um, you know, the Haredi community is not monolithic. Right, which many people think it is. Which many people think it is, and, and that's, you know, to my great worry, um, that is a little bit of the picture that you get from some of the shows Right. Um, and some of the movies, um, you, you get the feeling that it is just one, you know, static body that's not changing. And these are people who live like fundamentalist in the days of the shtetl in the 15th century. That's not true. And uh, the reason why doing this was important to me is as, as an American Israeli, you know, having this discussion and really educating and, and you know, cr creating the impetus behind this discussion for world Jewry, specifically American Jewry, that was that was kind of uh, my my uh, driving goal. D this is just something, as you mentioned, the community isn't monolithic. I mean, maybe this should come later, but I was curious to know: Do you see the arrive? You know, the computer world. Even COVID, do you think it has changed some of the dynamics oh, between? Sure. Yeah. Sure. I mean, there's. Uh, I think we're, we're we're gonna we're gonna get to it in a bit. But but the you know what I mentioned before, there are tectonic shifts going on in Israel. Um, I, I I was gonna save this for later, but the uh, I would say the I would use the term the revolution won't be televised. Mm -hmm. You think that there is you know. When you think of Israel, what do you think of? Um, as an American Jew, you think of Iran. You think of uh, maybe the Palestinian-Israeli issue, uh, the, the Israeli-Arab conflict. Um, you think of, you know, I would say the sexy topics, right? I'm here to say that this is the topic, this is the topic that will define Israel in the next 100 years. This topic, uh, you take the demographics, you take the statistics, you take basic numbers, which my colleague Tom will get into. This is the topic of discussion. And the fact that this discussion is not being had 
um, to me is almost a travesty because what, what are we addressing then? If, we're not, if, if we care for Israel or care for the world Jewish population or the Israel-American relationship, how are we not discussing this topic? But when you say, just to clarify, when you say it's the topic, yeah. are you basically referring to whether the religious parties will have continue to have enormous power over Israeli politics? whether Israel is going to move in a theocratic level or a secular level, just explain for me and the audience. I mean, right now, uh, you know, I, I, I don't like taking the discussion into, you know, the political realm too much, but what's going on in Israel right now, if you haven't noticed, for the first time ever, there's a prime minister who wears a kippah in Israel. For the first time. He sits in a government with a representative of the Southern Islamic Movement. It's called Ram. It's a party called Ram. The politician, his name is Mansour Abbas. This is a, a man, Naftali Bennett, who wears a kippah, who's a settler, so to speak, who is sitting in a government with Mansour Abbas. And for the first time in many years, the people who are not sitting in this government are the Haredi leadership are the actual Haredi parties that have been kind of at the core of this issue, really. You know, the ones who held on to the finances of Israel for so many years. Um, so, exactly. So, so to your point, Daphne, um, I think, you know, what's going on in Israel is, is momentous. Politically, socially, it's just... Uh, it just, it needs the airtime, um, and that's why we started the Q initiative. So just asking Tom, who's been waiting very patiently, um, as far as I understand, you're a private sector person involved in real estate investing. What motivated you to make this foray into the nonprofit world and join Sean? in this endeavor? Firstly, I'm uh, happy to stay quiet. I'm very good at that. Um, I'd rather you may speak a little. Yeah, I'd rather listen to people than talk usually, but uh, in any event, through, through my work, probably for a bit over 10 years now, I, um, I, I met the Haredi community in the US. And uh, also background, very brief, secular Tel Avivian, in simple terms. Um, and that, that was my first interaction with, with uh, Haredi community. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I grew friendships there, relationships, uh, and probably the majority of my work, I openly speaking prefer to work with them um, for a number of reasons. From there, I, I was introduced to the community in Israel as well. Uh, Avitali brought up Yoshua Pfeffer is a very good personal friend of mine. He's the uh, editor of Tzarech Yun. Um, and through that, through Pfeffer and others, I, I started supporting uh, certain initiatives in Israel around education and employment for Haridim. I started uh, funding various research at independent think tanks on the matter. I... Um, Cut a long story short, about a year ago, Sean and I, who know each other from middle school, uh, Sean said in, in pretty direct terms, do you want to be a schmuck and you know continue reading stuff and, and funding stuff and uh, being a backseat driver, which is not, not my style usually? Uh, or, or do you want to you know, do something more? And uh, that, that's how this came to be. And uh, I, I, I will give numbers, although Sean's the more analytical one, and I'm the more culturally, uh, you know, inclined. Whatever. I. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I think, firstly, it's, it's, it is a big issue. I think it's, uh, it's, frankly, an existential issue for the country, and uh, we won't get into the emotional aspect, etc. That you should be helping these people, and as, as 
uh, Jonathan said at the beginning, what he was speaking about, bagliot are the equivalent of a high school education. So you can't go to university and whatnot without a high school education. We can get into that a bit later regarding GED programs and such, but uh, th there is an emotional com component that you should help them. Nonetheless, to give some simple numbers of, I, I was involved in certain policy papers, et cetera, that amongst other things, uh, maybe some of you have seen recently, there was uh, a change. There's the uh, exemption age for, from the Army went down from 24 to 21. That was a big deal that people were trying to push for a while. I think it's, it's nice, it's a win, but it's, it's less a big deal than people think. Um, but in, in simple terms, you have roughly 13% of the population today is Haredi. Uh, they are growing at a, at a far disproportionate rate to the rest of the population. Even the Arab Israelis, which were thought to be growing at a high pace, have flatlined in recent years. So you know, I, I'll preface any projections because I've seen the, the, how, how they make them. If it's 20 years or 30 years or whatever, don't worry about that. That's, that's focus on, on direction because those numbers are very easy to manipulate and usually they're very manipulated when they're put into a pu publication. Um, but within, call it, 30 years, they will make up, the Haredim will make up a third of the population in Israel. Yonatan did a show that hopefully we'll touch on called Autonomies, which I think is uh, an unbelievable show, uh, very relevant to, to this. And as they grow to be a third of the population, then today, roughly, no one has exact figures, but they cost the country, I'm, I'm speaking as though it's an antagonistic, but it's not. Uh, the, the, the cost of the country is roughly two and a half to three percent of GDP. Within 30 years, uh, that'll be in excess of 6%. I read, I think it was this week or last week, uh, the Bank of Israel put projections out for 2022, and they got all, all excited that they will have 7% GDP growth. That's after a year of COVID, with inflation, with a lot of other things, and they're jumping up and down. 7% GDP growth would be uh, treading water. And, and the difference from you know, going from 13 to call it 30% of the population, uh, for, for that to continue doubling from 30 to 60 will happen far, far faster. Uh, same, likewise, from 3% of GDP to 6%, 6 to 12 will go far faster. So it's, it's, it's just, there's a direction which it's going, whether it's 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, doesn't really matter as far as I'm concerned. Um, and, and to illustrate a little bit, so I, again, with, research, which I'm not uh, the most fond of, but uh, I, I uh, took on uh, independent research from an economist at the World Bank about a year ago, and uh, uh, trying to put in as layman terms as possible, uh, the projections were that within 30 years, if the situation persists, then GDP per capita will be on par with Turkey. I think that can resonate with people, that causes a brain drain, that causes increase in crime, that causes really a, a deterioration of society, let alone culture. Uh, and the inverse, if, if it can be reversed, or if it can be normalized, then within the same time frame, it's a GDP per capita on par with Denmark. Um, I think that that's, that's you know, pretty illustrative. Uh, and to, to have a as Sean spoke of, uh, you know, it's a very divisive topic where it's, it's actually even more divisive in Israel as opposed to in the U.S. Uh, you have the island of Tel Aviv and you have, you know, a few other islands and uh, one doesn't mingle with the other. Uh, so even, even for myself in Tel Aviv, people would look at me funny as, as you know, you're going to Mas Sharim, et cetera, et cetera. And, I, I will add to that that a lot of the, the policy and people involved, I would sit with academic institutions in Jerusalem, and everybody knows everybody, but I, I would ask them about certain people who, who had research programs. I said, sure, we've spoken, et cetera, et cetera. And, and uh, then I, I would ask, when, when did you meet last? I said, oh, uh, they never came here. And, and to me, this was insane. This was, you know, it's like buying a property without going to it. it in, my, in my terms, it's a, 
you need to kick the tires a little bit. I thought it was insane. Uh, any, anyways, so if this can be corrected, then aside from the financial implications or the economic implications, uh, you will have more of a cohesive, less divisive society. And, and such a society also can um, combat issues such as, you know, we, we have neighbors all around. God willing, there will be some sort of peace at a certain point. Uh, but you can't do that when, when there's too much internal... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm obviously phobic, microphone phobic. Um, could you describe a few of the program, the actual activities that the your organization, like how they, how you're implementing your beliefs? So the the main one that Sean and I actually started pushing during COVID, I'm. I'll get technical, but I'll keep it concise. I, as, as much as possible. So as, as Yonatan described, going from a yeshiva, uh, there are nuances. We won't get into all of them because we'll, we'll be here for a week. But, but uh, generally speaking, people in the yeshiva age do not learn basic English math science. Um, and those are the bagliot, which is the equivalent of a high school education. So uh, w without that, they cannot advance anywhere. You know, maybe to work at Pizza Hut, but not, not much beyond that. I, there are programs which provide for, it's called a mechina, it's, it's a, a one-year program in which they go through, uh, which, in which they go through a GED level education. At the end, they finish their bagliot. With that, they can then go to, to university or vocational training or whatever it may be. Um, and those programs are not Haredi or secular. Those are at uh, various academic institutions. Um, and for the most part, they are government subsidized. So the programs are a non-issue. Tuition is also a non-issue. Uh, and, and even beyond that, because there are cultural elements to this, there are institutions with Haredi separate campuses, which is a very big deal to attract them to come in. So that exists. Uh, from there to continue to academia or vocational studies. Also, many programs, Haredi and not, which exist, uh, as well as tuition uh, or subsidies, uh, scholarships, et cetera, to support it. That exists as well. From there, um, um, I'll end with the issue. From there, uh, to be put into employment also, there was, uh, I think it was a couple weeks ago, uh, there was a conference a month ago, maybe the Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem Post Conference, and, and um, who was it, the, the one from Microsoft, or in, I don't know. She, she, she said there's a need for another 50,000, uh, immediately, a need for another 50,000 high paying jobs within the high tech industry in Israel, okay? So even if you just push them towards tech and, and you have the educational institutions to provide them, you know, the, the means to get there, I, th that exists as well. The issue that we found and where, where we have not seen others attacking is leaving a coil. So you touched on it very briefly, but leaving coil is what's called a kitzbat coil. That's a, a living stipend. That's effectively what we saw in the clip. Uh, it's a living stipend which enables to buy diapers and materna. That's more or less the, the uh, how they conjugate it. I'm when they leave the coil, they forego that living stipend. As a result, uh, these are not people who have savings, so they can't make ends meet. Also consider leaving the coil, that means that they're married, and, and with the exemption age only now going to 21, so being 24 plus, they have at least a couple of kids in the house. Uh, and, and simply they could not absorb, you know, I think the average is about 2,000 shekels a month. They, they couldn't absorb a loss of 2,000 to 1,500 shekels a month to still carry on their life. Uh, and those kitzvot, depending which koilel, are funded uh, approximately half via private donors and half via government funding. Uh, but th there was, as they went from the coil into a mechina program, they did not have anything to subsidize this. Thus, the people who would, who would 
uh, go into the Mechino typically had money from home, which is atypical within the community. Uh, others went, go as well, but long story short, you have 50% dropout rates within these Mechinot. One, one year program, 50% dropout rates. Why? Because they need to take another uh, pizza delivery job, literally, in the evenings, uh, while also cramming a year of education, the brain of somebody 25, 26 is not the same as the brain of somebody who's eight, and in a small apartment with, with uh, family, it's very difficult. Um, and, and so what we've identified is by enabling, by giving them a replacement for that subsidy, we've seen dropout, rate, dropout rates go down to roughly between 10 to 20, say 15 to make life simple. The ones who graduate those mechinot have an extremely high success rate of further integrating into, into the labor pool. Um, and, and an element of that, this is the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll end with on this, uh, the, the discipline that they have inherently is very different from the rest of society. You know, Again, you have someone in their mid-20s with responsibilities. When they go to work, they go to work. You have somebody in their mid-20s in, in Tel Aviv, quite literally. If, if, if they come without a hangover, you're very lucky. <laughs> um, and that, that's, that's, that's really Fine. That's the story. Um, we could obviously go on talking forever, but we won't. And I just wanted to throw it open to any questions anyone might have. We'll bring a mic to you. I'm curious about, you were talking about the women making the money, they're architects, they're lawyers. Can you explain how they got educated to be able to have those careers? Are they educated the same way men are, separately, encouraged to uh, get educated? Because I know in the olden days, I don't think they were. So how did that change and how are they treated growing up to empower them uh, to go on to have these high paying jobs? Um, it's a great question, and I'm sorry I missed that detail in my summary. Uh, over the last years, there's been a proliferation of programs for Haredi women that are like college degrees, essentially, that are very vocationally specific, um, that allows them to enter. Um, some are programs that don't give a degree, some do. Um, I know many women who do not get degrees but are still able to enter high tech with some sort of a certificate and grow internally. Um, in terms of how are they empowered to do that, uh, the empowerment is actually very much theological. Uh, a lot of the way that girls are taught from a young age is that your greatest aspiration in life is to be married to a Torah scholar and that your job is to support him in being that Torah scholar. That is the ultimate for a woman in this society. So it starts at a very young age in that way. Um, again, it's sort of like indirect, right? They're not being told to go pursue a career for the sake of a career. Um, but that sort of push really, I think, push puts them into a position where you will find women in these positions and careers. I would like to add uh, uh, a short note and, and connect also to, to, you, to your, uh, uh, what do you said? Um, I think uh, um, um, also the, the, the leadership, the, the Haredi leadership, uh, the the politicians and the, the 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 rabbis the big rabbis they are also understand that they can't stand like 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 they 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 have they used to do in the in the last uh, decades and they need to 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 go to a, to to another stage and it start uh, years ago 10 or maybe 20 years ago when they understood that they need to to bring the opportunity of for the the women to go to to learn in the university and to ar ar architecture and uh, another things, and it's now also happening in the like you said about the politician uh, the, the political situation with with also with the men because uh, I think there is a, a phrase in uh, Aramic ichshar uh, dara which is mean the the generation is is ready, and and I think they 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 know that um, it need to be a big change, but they don't can do it by themselves. So 
they are very happy. I think so. I, uh, for my uh, uh, my my uh, um, uh, opinion, they are very happy with this government, and maybe they are not happy that they are don't part of the of this uh, government. But they they can't be part of the government. But they happy about what is uh, going to be. And I think for for. Because that your work is so uh, uh, in, uh, important, but not just important, because it was important a lot of years. But it can be the change can be can 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 became uh, uh, true this 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 generation this time. So um, and it's very 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 important for the Haredi community and of course for the the Israeli for for the state of Israel. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, I know that military service was another hot button issue. And the military has managed to bring Jews from all over the world and all backgrounds and integrate them into an Israeli people. But the Haredi stay outside of that. Is it, and I know that there's been a lot of back and forth on this. Has any progress been made? Yeah, so uh, um, maybe uh, Tom uh, will, will, will talk about it. Uh, uh, Sean, sorry. Uh, Tom also, <laughs> if you want to, but shortly I will say just that that the the the, the government in Israel understood in the last years that this is not the the, the goal to bring the the, the Haredim to to the army, because first of all because the army don't need the Haredim, <laughs> they don't need a, a yeshiva boys with uh, guns. It's not. It will not. It will. It will not uh, be a good idea. Although and there is modern Orthodox. Yeah, factor yeah, in the army yeah, is called it's, it's there. Yeah, of course. So that's separate. First of all, because because of that, and the second thing is that um, uh, uh, the Haredi will not go to the army, and what they are dealing now, it's okay. They are not going to the army, but let's bring them to the to the to the job market. I don't know to the how it's Maybe called. The the, yeah. the army is is. I mean, if, if you read what's going on, the likelihood is that within not too long a period of time, the army will become a professional army. It will no longer be a mandatory draft. Already you have a very high percentage which don't go. Uh, and it's a, it's a hot topic, especially for Haredim. So maybe autonomiot, you had a civil war exactly over this. And I'll uh, just add on briefly. Uh, it's an interesting question you had. I served in the Israeli army. I served in uh, a unit called 8200. It's a cybersecurity unit. Uh, in my, the room where my unit was based in the base, I had three Haredi soldiers. Very, this was not common, right? This was, this was something uh, out of the ordinary, um, but it's it's happening. Things are slowly slowly moving on all fronts. Um, um, maybe Haredim not joining um, combat units, as you say, Yonatan. But even that is happening. You even have a, a unit called Nachal Haredi. If if you've heard of it, it's a it's a unit, um, a combat unit in the IDF that is kind of Haredi centric, and it it uses all of the you know. It, it caters to the Haredi lifestyle choices, um, albeit it's not, you know, it's not the top choice yet. But um, but there really is movement on all fronts. I would just like to say, with w what we're doing with Kiyum, uh, we understood that the Haredi community is very wary of outside bodies trying to initiate change. And saying that as two secular people is is quite uh, you know uh, you know pertinent because w you know we 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 noticed this quite soon that we needed to work with the Haredi community, we needed rabbis behind us, we needed people to uh, you know coarsely coarsely put to teach us how to speak their language. You know when we went to one of the campuses, we were in Mea Sharim, which is pure Haredi, um, we couldn't just sit there and, and, and speak uh, Tel Avivis to them. Um, that, that, and, and, and that is 
emanates from the fact that they are um, very, very, I wouldn't say dismissive, but they don't look at outside bodies so so well. They don't look at it as whether, th whether it's the army, whether it's the government, um, whether it's even companies, you know, national, multinational companies. Um, so, so we need to decide how to uh, implement this change in a more nuanced way, um, but at the same time, this change is happening on its own. Yeah. I would even put it strongly, you said, maybe more strongly or too strongly. I think within the Haredi community, there's a certain amount, you could call it paranoia, that outsiders are going to weaken the hold of the Haredi community. So as you say, one has to be... I mean, I mean f for sure, uh, outsiders, I, I would just tweak that sentence, outsiders will weaken the leadership. True. Um, I don't know how much time we have for more. We have time for one last question over here. Oh, I, I'm lucky me. Um, so uh, to tie sort of everything you, that I've heard today, so the work you're doing at Kiyum seems, you know, drawn to um, helping people who want um, more than just what they're traditionally getting in the Haredi community. We saw the first clip uh, of Shtisel where there seemed to be a lot of, and again, different story because you're, you know, there was a, you know, Kiva wanting to be an artist, and then Reb Shtisel, you know, kind of resistant to to that change and to what direction he was going. So, how are you? Are you general? Do you have a generational divide that you have to really work with to try to, you know, where you have like your nephew who wanted to do something different, but you know, h how does that work? And is that is that one of the bigger challenges you have, or is it not one of the bigger ones? It's, look, you're not going to put somebody who's 60 years old into a job after they've been coiled for 40 years. So that's that's not the demographic, that's not the low-hanging fruit. I'm Low-hanging fruit is really, you know, let's say mid-20s to mid-30s, which now is, uh, uh, can go down to 21 due to the Army exemption. It wouldn't surprise me, by the way, if in a few years or in a few months uh, you, ha you have a, a change in government. Hopefully not, but you know that could happen as well, and it could go from back from 21 to 24. So that, that's not a reliable uh, source. Of, uh, you, can't, you can't rely on that. But call it mid-20s to mid-30s, predominantly because people are less set in their ways at that, at that point. I would just add two, uh, there are two things that came into factor that uh, the Haredi leadership, uh, I don't know what they feel about it, at least the political leadership and the rabbinical le leadership, but that's the internet and that's cell phones. <laughs> the, the amount of change that is entering the Haredi street from those two things, having a mobile phone in your pocket with access to the internet, Jonathan. In the Haredi outfits, there is no uh, free internet. There is a very, very controlled internet, like for just for mail. My parents, they have email, but just this. If you search uh, something on Google, so you say you have you you block. Um, so um, yeah, uh, um, um, I I I I will try to say something for for um, uh, for the end. Um, you know. Um, I started with 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 the story about uh, Thomas Wolf and um, uh, and about how it's uh, tough and hard to to go back home. But sometimes I I I, I discover that the 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 only way to to go back home is through through a story, because in the story your home is uh, remains exactly how how you left it, and you can leave the home. Endless times, but you can you can return to it because you have the story. Um, so uh, you 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 have a very very power uh, powerful story to tell and 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 to make the the change, not just to tell it to to make it and 
I, 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 uh, thank you for uh, inviting me here. Thank you for coming. Thank you uh, both for uh, uh, for this and and um, yeah, we'll we'll hope for uh, for a good story. A good yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you all for coming. And thank you.